All right, 2 Timothy, and if there was ever a, a, a passage that I'd like for you to be mindful of or to pay attention to, um, I, I'd like for you to pay attention to how this passage comes to fruition. In other words, how it begins to, to take place, what you begin to see happening here. Notice verse 5, having a form of godliness, denying the power thereof, from such turn away. So there's your command is to get away from them. Don't hang around them. The reason for that is, is because they're so good at what they do and so convincing in their ways that he errs on the side of you need to stay away from them because otherwise you're going to wind up getting hoodooed by them. They're going to wind up uh, causing you to uh, get messed up because they're so convincing. In the time of the tribulation, the Bible teaches that if the Lord didn't shorten the days, the very elect, that's the 144,000 male virgin Jews that have the sign of God in their forehead, that the, that the very elect would be deceived. The deception is so great by the Antichrist that you would think it Christ himself. The deception of these teachers is so great <clears throat> that if you stay around them before long, they'll teach you wrong and false doctrine. So what the Lord does to you is say that there's some things that you just should have nothing to do with. Modern theology says, well, go ahead and get involved with it. Get as close to the edge as you possibly can. And then, you know, be able to back away when you want to. The problem is, is that stuff can suck you in both emotionally and intellectually. Oftentimes, emotionally, what happens to you is you get to know somebody and they're nice people and you go through some things together and you like them and you're kind to them and you begin to kind of entertain some of their thoughts. Well, I mean, you know, they, they can't be all wrong because they're, they're so nice and, you know, they picked up the tab for dinner and they gave me some money and uh, they picked up my kids from school and, and when our kids play ball together and, I mean, I, look, I know they're not Bible believers and they're not King James and, and I know they're their doctrines off a little bit and I know they worship Mary and you know but but I mean they're just really and they go to church every week and and they're just real nice by the way Val and Olga made it down from Massachusetts yeah good to see you guys glad you're here and and the baby is the baby oh the baby's here praise the Lord let's see the baby sorry come on you can do better than that oh there you go how great is that? Good to see you guys. Interview tomorrow. Okay, good. Praise the Lord. We'll be praying for that. All right, so anyway, here's what can happen. The Lord knows we're emotional creatures, right? And the Lord knows that we tend to want, believe it or not, not everybody is an ogre and, and wants to be a recluse and be by themselves. He created us to have fellowship with Him. And so we like to have fellowship with other people. We like friends. That's what has called a company called Facebook to make billions of dollars based on friending people. It's human nature that they're making money off of because they know that everybody likes to be liked and we like to hang around with people that we like and, and they like us. Well, what happens to us oftentimes when it comes to biblical things is, is that the Bible goes the way of the American Indian. It passes off the scene because we like Joel Osteen and we like, well, maybe that's a stretch a little bit, but... <laughs> But, but, but we like people and we stop considering the doctrinal issues or the differences. And then before long, you know what? You begin to understand, shall I say, alternate lifestyles. Because they're so nice, you know, and, and they're kind. And, and, you know, ladies, those guys, they kind of have a, a flair for the feminine side. And, and they're so creative and, and they're so good with colors. And, and, and it's like, well, I just have so much in common with them. And they just like to talk and, and they like to listen. And, and, and then before long, it's like, well, I know they shouldn't. But they're so nice. <laughs> Right? And then the same thing begins to happen. Didn't mean to make you sick, Brother Mitch. <clears throat> then the same thing begins to happen. And what's very prevalent nowadays is you have two girls, Butch and Butchette. And they don't all look like brogans and overalls. And they're so nice. And, and they're so smart. And, and, and they don't, they're, they're not causing any trouble. They're just a little alternate. They're just a little different. 
But I mean, after all, you know, you don't know how they were raised and, you know, there's nothing really definitive about that. Do you understand where I'm going? I don't need to continue with that. But what begins to happen is, is that then what we have is this saying in the South, blood is thicker than the Bible. In other words, it doesn't matter what the Bible says. It matters what the family says. It matters what the matriarch of the family says. It matters what, you know, granddaddy or grandmama says or nana and papa says or the next thing you know. Church begins to be a popularity contest as opposed to being a doctrinal safety zone where I'm able to come into a sanctuary and feel safe. Nobody is going to try to corrupt me in here. It becomes all about personalities. It becomes all about all of the things that makes us feel good and we recognize our differences and, and, and let's don't talk about our differences. Let's talk about what we have in common. I mean, after all, uh, the Roman Catholics do worship Mary and they do have a Pope and they do believe in the sacraments and they do the stations of the cross and, and they do, you know, believe in infant baptism and purgatory and stuff. But they're so nice. And then the next thing you know, but the Bible says, and then you're like, you know what? You're talking about my friend. And the next thing you know, it's I'm not going to church over there. That's hate speech. He's talking about my friend and he doesn't even know them. You don't think the devil knows that personalities matter? And then all of a sudden what happens is, is we throw the Bible out the window when our relationship with Jesus Christ is gone, but our friendship with other people. Watch, here's the Bible. Friendship with the world is enmity with God. So diabolically opposed. Is that a fair statement? Yes, sir. All right, now I want you to watch. That's the mindset. That's the foyer. That's the foundation for where we're headed tonight. I want you to notice how the form of God is denying the power thereof from such turn away. For this sort of they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women with sins led away with diverse lusts. Notice that they lead captive silly women that are laden with sin already. The silly women are not silly as in general for all women. The silly women are the ones that are already laden in themselves with sin, which sets them up for being led captive. Amen. Because if they're already under conviction for doing something wrong, it then makes them susceptible to listening to somebody that would condone their wrongdoing. One of the ways they're led captive is to say, that's really not that bad. They're already laden with sin. They're already gossiping or slandering. They're already doing things they shouldn't do. Are you with me? These individuals come in and take advantage of that. Why? Because no conviction at all. I've told you already, one of the greatest things that help you know you're in fellowship with the Lord and to know you're saved is conviction from the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit saying to you, you know better than that and you shouldn't do it. When that conscience gets seared, when it begins to go away, what starts happening to you and I is, is we can't hear the Holy Spirit. He hadn't quit talking, but our conscience, because we keep turning him off and turning him off and turning him off and turning him off, it's like a blister on your hand. If you've ever had a shovel or a hoe in your hand before, and you're out there working and working and you get a blister and then after a while the blister comes off and then a callus forms and then you wind up getting calluses. Your heart gets that way. The Holy Spirit is still there putting the friction in, but it can't get in there anymore. It doesn't get there. The light can't get in anymore. You with me so far? So what happens is if you read the passage slowly, you find out that the silly women he's talking about are women that are already committing things they shouldn't. They're laden with sin. And then he goes further to say, and then has a multiplicity or diverse lust, a, a multitude of different things. It's not just one thing of lust. It's a multitude of things. Now watch what happens after you say that. So don't put every woman in that particular situation. Then he says this. He says, ever learning, watch, and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Heavenly Father, would you please uh, watch over us tonight, care for us, help us as we go through these passages. Lord, I pray that you'll be with Brother Will and Miss Julie and their mothers. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you'll guide and direct uh, the surgeons, the doctors, the anesthesiologists, the hospice care workers. And Lord, that you'll comfort them as only you can. And if it be your will, that you would comfortably take them home to be with you. Thankful that they're saved. Thankful that they know that they're saved. But Lord, nonetheless, the, the sadness of that is a difficult thing. Would you please be with them? And also, Father, would you be right now with Kevin and Ripka, uh, especially Ripka, 
as she brings a new baby into the world. And we'd ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right, now look in verse number 8, because it clearly gives you an idea of some things before I get into ever learning and ever able to come to the knowledge of truth. Did you ever know why? Excuse me, look why you can't do it. As Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, now he's going to show you, so do these, so also. What? Resist what? Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. Now we're going to talk about that. So here's what I want you to understand. Janus and Jambres are magicians. Sleight of hands. Able to do things that the eye are looking for. I've told you before, the magician that I talked to before, he said, look, it's not as hard to do magic as people think it is because most people are already looking to see what you're trying to show. In other words, they kind of want to be tricked. They kind of want to be fooled. But here's where the thing is. The way that they get in is, is that already their mind is so corrupted that when the truth comes, they resist the truth. What that does is open them up the same way it has opened up these women. What is the problem? Because when the truth comes in, the women resist the truth. That makes them susceptible to being taken captive. And that's why the Lord refers to them as silly. Let me see if I can show you some of these things here. Look in 2 Peter chapter number 2. It's not that they're not exposed to the truth. It's that when they are exposed to the truth, they resist the truth. That's a mouthful. Yes, sir. That means God gives you a choice when you sit down to read your Bible. And I've told you before, the hardest truth in the Bible is not to try to get whether or not there was a pre-Adamite race and not to try to get uh, things going on in uh, other planets and all that other kind of stuff. That stuff's not even hard to get a hold of. The hardest truth in that Bible is a truth where the Holy Spirit says you're the problem. Yeah. Yeah. That's the hardest truth in the Bible to accept is I'm the one with the problem. It ain't hard to accept the truth that there's a problem in the nation. There's a problem with the, the presidential candidates. There's a problem with the politics in this world. There's a problem with wars in this world. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. You're right. And the Lord said, uh, and you are the man. And it's like, well, now, wait a minute, Lord. I mean, I, I might be guilty of that, but did you see Brother Larry? You see TK when he came in? You see that new car he's driving? I mean, the city gave him that. I mean, I mean the Lord, did you? And the Lord's like, thou art the man. The hardest truth in that Bible, ladies and gentlemen, is when God tries to have a personal relationship with you and says, you're the problem. You know what the tendency is? Did you see Miss Trina? That's a duck. That's the truth. What will happen is, is that all of a sudden God will be dealing with you. And maybe it's through the preaching. Maybe when all the people are up here singing or something and the Holy Spirit begins to deal with you. And as He begins to deal with you and talk to you and stuff like that, that person you got a problem with will all of a sudden stand up and come to the altar. And it may not be the Holy Spirit. It might be the devil in him because the devil knows he can trip your trigger because you're dealing, he's dealing with you, the Lord is. And then all of a sudden that person you don't like, that Martha in your life or that John in your life stands up and it's kind of like, oh, what are they going up there for? And the Lord's like, why do you care? Why don't you come on? Amen. And you go, know, oh, Lord, they got a problem. They need to be there. And the Lord's like, I ain't talking to them now. I'm talking to you. But that's hard truth. People say, you know, the truth in the Bible, it's not intellectual truth, it's heart truth. It's stuff where God's saying, you think you're perfect? No, sir, Lord, I, I don't believe I am. As a matter of fact, I'm so humble, I pray and I fast twice a week and I thank God I'm not like that guy over there beating on his chest and all that kind of stuff. I mean, Lord, I'm here, I give over and above the tithe and I come every time the doors are open. And I mean, if you want to find, you know, Christian, you look at the word cross and find me right there at the foot of it. Lord, I mean, after all, I mean, I'm the poster child for that kind of a thing. And the Lord's like a little proud, aren't you? Well, Lord, I mean, I just thank God I'm not like the preacher. I mean, you know how that preacher is. Full of himself, proud, arrogant, obnoxious. I don't know who he thinks he is. The Lord's like, okay, what about you? Do you see? That's a hard truth, isn't it? That's what we're talking about. When the truth is presented, they resist the truth. It's not the blood atonement. It's not salvation by grace through faith. It's not baptism doesn't save you. It's not the Lord's Supper doesn't save you. 
It's not how we have two ordinances in the church of baptism and the Lord's Supper for the pictures of that. It has nothing to do with that truth. That's intellectual truth. It's not Jesus died on the cross according to the Scripture, buried, raised again the third day according to the Scripture. It's not Paul's gospel. It's not even rightly dividing the Bible. It's that truth where God says, Thou art the man. That's the truth that he's talking about. When these guys hear it, they resist it. And guess what happens? Those people in the passage resist it also. 2 Peter chapter number 2, I know you can't wait to get in it. Look at verse number 1. But there were false, false prophets also among the people, even also false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious, that sneaky, slippery ways, by reason of whom the way of truth will be evil spoken of. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long lingereth not and their damnation slumbereth not. You know what he says there? He says there's some individuals making merchandise of people in the church, telling them what they want to hear, condoning the sin that they're doing, not being personal with it, and it's all for their own personal gain. It's not bad to do what you're doing. You know everybody has a little sin. Well, that's not what the Bible says. Well, preacher, nobody's perfect. First John chapter number 2. First John chapter number 2. <clears throat> their minds are corrupted. I guess I would say it this way. Their filter's bad. So no matter what truth comes in, the filter twists it and they make it fit wherever they want to get it. You ever wonder why you've been in a church service sometimes and the uh, Holy Spirit has got you under such heavy conviction, man, you feel like you're going to break like an egg under a giant's heel? And you're thinking, man, I can't hardly stink and breathe, man. And you don't know whether to get up and go to the altar or stop and pray where you are or whatever. You, you feel like you can't catch your breath. And you look over and hear somebody messing with their phone and hear somebody playing with an iPad and hear somebody laughing and cutting up and clowning around. And you're thinking, what am I missing? What's, what's going on? It has to do with when they hear the truth, it's what they do with it. Can the truth find its way into your heart? I've watched them sit in jail cells sometimes. That old preacher's up there preaching and the place be cut, packed full and have guys on the front row sound asleep and have guys over here drawing, got their feet propped up on the thing and this and that and the other. And then you get to the end of that thing and you're thinking nobody's listening. And then a half a dozen of them are down on their face crying like little babies and stuff like that because God's dealing with them individually. And you're thinking, well, what about all these other people? They heard the truth that they were going to hell and they said, I don't care. It doesn't make no difference to me and just literally turned it off. And it's like BB's hitting a rubber tire. Didn't even put a mark on it. I mean, they walked out of that service. These guys are under heavy conviction. Their palms are sweating, literally. And they're down there on the floor crying puddles of tears in front of all that stuff. You'd think that whole place would be under conviction. And guys walk out of there, you know, see you later and telling dirty jokes and cussing and doing all kind of stuff like that. What is that? That's God dealing with you individually in this day and time. That's God putting a finger in your face and saying, you're the problem, not everybody else. Now, we all need that. But sometimes we don't like the vessel that it comes from. I guarantee you Balaam sure didn't like the fact that his donkey was talking to him. I mean, he didn't like it so bad he beat the tar out of him. And then finally the Lord said, go ahead and tell him. And the donkey said, if you hit me one more time, I'm going to kick the fool out of you. <laughs> that's in the, between the lines there in the original. That's in the original Hebrew somewhere. <laughs> but, but you know what he says to him? He said, hey, stupid, can't you see what's fixing to take your head off? You say, what was that donkey doing? He was preaching before he ever opened his mouth. You see how he was preaching? He wouldn't go where Balaam was trying to drive him. He said, I ain't going. You want to get your head cut off? Go ahead. I ain't going. He's preaching, but he ain't opening his mouth. That thing about truth is so... so the, the Bible teaches you in the beginning that Lord is that truth. Sanctify them with thy word is... But what happens, you can't get sanctified unless you apply it yourself. Amen. He doesn't wash nations anymore. He washes people. That's good, brother. Individual, people, not robes, people. First John chapter number 2, look if you will, verse number 18. Little children, it is the last time. And as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists whereby we know that it is the last time. You know what happens? He says in the last days, there's people in there trying to fish you out of the pond. Yep. What do they do? We're talking about Janice and Jambres. Those are evil magicians. Those magicians were so powerful they could do anything that Moses and Aaron could do except create something out of nothing. 
That's pretty powerful stuff. That's pretty tricky if you ask if you if you ask anybody. Come to 1 John chapter number 4. 1 John chapter 4. That's why I'm trying to explain to you the the tricks, the ability for him to do it. You know what he'll do? He'll use somebody close to you. He'll use somebody close to you that's got your ear, talk to you, pull you away, pull you out, get you away. You don't need to be around that. Did you hear about so and so? Well, no. Well, has the whole Lord ever spoke to you there? Well, yeah, but I don't like, you know, so-and-so was there and, you know, they got a new car and they think they're all that and a bag of chips now and this and that and the other. You know, the church has just become uh, Laodicea now. I'm hearing that. Uh, the church is full of hypocrites now and all that. You mean it wasn't full of hypocrites when you were here? Yeah. Or are we just minus one hypocrite now? Church is just full of hypocrites now. You know, how, you know how they are. Really? You're saying that? Never go to church? Don't read your Bible? Don't pray? And you're calling people in church hypocrites? Why, why, what, a, what a thing. I don't, I don't even understand that. You, but you know what happens? If you get in that backslidden condition, you start going, you go, yeah, yeah, you know what? That's right. Yeah, you know what? That's right. That bunch of fools over there, man, acting the fool, acting stupid like that. You know, I never did understand why they had to do all that kind of stuff. You on the way out, you say, what's happened? It ain't just silly women being led captive. Amen. It's feminized men. Sure. Come on. I mean, it's men that have got pink blood instead of red blood. <laughs> It's men, you know, we're wearing the pastel colors and stuff. And it's men that are, oh, okay, honey, okay, honey, whatever you say, honey. That's the last days. In the last days, Isaiah 3, women and children have the rule over them. You mean to tell me, sir, you ask your wife and your kids before you could say, we're going to church. You say, honey, do y'all want to go to church? Oh, oh, got kind of quiet right there. Oh, you think that's the way it ought to be? Yeah, I know I've upset some of you men now and some of you people that are watching over the internet. You, you just turn the thing off. Like, oh, yeah, well, you know, he's, he's putting it on me. Okay, well, don't take my word for it. God gave you one of the greatest privileges He could ever give you. He made you to the head of the house. But let me tell you what goes with that. You're accountable for your house. And you can duck it any way you want to duck it. Tell me, oh, I don't want to go there. My wife don't like how you talk. Okay, good. Then she probably don't like how you talk either and would divorce you, but it's cheaper to keep you. But the bottom line is, then go find some place for her to go. The truth is, is you just don't want to go. Don't put it on the way the preacher talks, okay? Uh, 1 Peter chapter number, I mean, I'm sorry, 1 John 4, verse number 1. Beloved, believe not every spirit. Try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Uh, come over, if you will, please, to Acts chapter 13. Resisting the truth is what we're talking about. You say, preacher, what do they do? The, what opens you up is you're already laden with sin, and then when the truth comes down about the sin you're committing, you refuse it, and when you refuse it, that thing works like a hot iron. It begins to sear you, and after a period of time, you couldn't hear or recognize the truth when it's right in front of your face. Amen. And you'll be the very one saying, I believe the King James Bible is the Word of God. I believe it's the truth from cover to cover. Really? Then what are you doing with the verses that apply to you? Yeah. Acts chapter number 13. We're trying to hurry along here. Look, if you will, please, in verse number 8. Eliamus the sorcerer, for his is the name by interpretation, withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Then Saul, who was called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him and said, O full of subtility, trickery, uh, slick, talking, con artist, able to, to pull the wolves out of good, good speakers and all mischief. Thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, will thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately they fell on him in the midst of the darkness, and he went out and went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. Now, Paul gets off the boat over there, and as soon as he gets off the boat, he's confronted by a man who's a smooth, fast-talking individual, and Paul calls him a devil, and he's not over there calking and asking him to come worship Satan. He doesn't have Anton LaVey's under the Bible. He's not making the signs of the devil or however you, however you do all that kind of stuff. He doesn't have upside down crosses with the thing broke off and the peace sign around him. He doesn't have tattoos all over him. He doesn't have, you know, uh, holes all in his head and stuff like that. He's full of fair words, fair speeches and subtlety. And he's tricking people all along the way. You know what Paul said? You're a devil. 
So much so that the boy John Mark that's over there with Paul at an earlier time, you know what happens? John Mark says, Paul, I think you're a little hard on that guy. He seems like such a nice fellow. And matter of fact, Paul, you know what? You are so hard and so rough on that guy. I don't think I'm going to go with you anymore. I don't believe I'm going to walk with you. You just missed out on nine years, boy. You'd have been the Timothy. You'd have been the Timothy. Yeah. Barnabas pulled some strings for you and put you next to the guy, Paul. But you didn't like how Paul handled it. You know why? You thought you knew what Paul did because you're listening to the guy. You think that guy can't be no harm. Paul said he's a devil. And he said, oh, he can't be a devil. You listen how he talks. He's a nice fella. Look at him. He's surrounded by women. I mean, people think he's the greatest thing since sliced bread. I mean, smooth as silk, man. I mean, listen to that guy talking. Paul calls him out, calls him a devil and blinds him. And John Mark says, that's a little too rough for me, preacher. Paul's getting ready to die over there in prison nine years later. You know what he says to, to the boys? He said, I tell you what, go ahead and bring John with you. He's profitable for the ministry. He's missed nine years. Because he thought he knew more than Paul. You say, what is that? The devil creates division. You know how he created a division? John Mark's looking at that guy and he's thinking, Paul, you blinded that guy. He didn't do nothing wrong. He's a nice guy. He wasn't cussing or screaming. He didn't look like the devil possessed man in Mark chapter 5. He wasn't coming down here naked and breathing threatenings to you and things like that. I mean, good night, preacher. That's a little rough. And Paul said, uh, there's some things here going on you can't see. Amen. Don't be fooled by the tricks, the wiles of the devil. Amen. He's slick. He's subtle. Yeah. He's an angel of light. His ministers are ministers of righteousness. Yeah, he stands in pulpits. He's got a King James yeah. under his arm. I mean, you know, I, and, and Paul, I, 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 well, I, I just think that's harsh. Me and my family leaving the church. And the devil's laughing. Do you honestly think when the devil showed up in Genesis chapter number 3, you think he showed up with horns and a pitchfork and a pointy tail? Sure, as I'm standing here, he showed up in his name of life. Hey, baby, how you doing? What you missing out on at home? Oh, Adam, not a good provider. And you know how I know? Well, pfft, you wouldn't be staring at that tree right there. The one that provides for Adam must not be a good provider. I mean, you wouldn't be looking at that tree, would you, baby? I know why you're looking at that tree. You're not getting your needs met at the house, are you? That old bag of bones ain't working like he ought to. And he ain't doing what he used to do, is he? Doesn't trip your trigger like he used to, does he, baby? Well, I can help you out, you know. Well, you know, I was just kind of looking, you know. Well, yea, hath God said. Right. Slick. Amen. He appealed to her. I don't know about you. I've never had a run-in with the devil himself, but I think, I think, I think if I saw him, I'd be like Martin Luther and throw an inkwell at him. I think he'd scare me to death. She's completely comfortable with him. She has a conversation with him. With a devil. Man, he must have put her right at ease. Must have been easy on the eyes, you reckon? Must have not been a must not have been a threat to her at all. That's your mother. She's the mother of all living. That's your mother. That's in your nature. Well, they just seem so nice, so kind, so so sweet. They got they got such a good agenda. Okay, God help you if you pick up and say, well, what does the Bible say? Come to 1 Kings chapter 22. 1 Kings chapter 22. I, I, I'm hearing a lot of stuff now and, uh, and I have some folks I'm talking with now and I, I want to, to talk. They are literally so consumed with there's going to be a vaccine for the virus. But in the vaccine, it's going to be the mark of the beast. Bill Gates is behind it. And him and Epstein were buddies. They got it all worked out. And it's to take over you because you're going to have the mark of the beast inside you. Well, first of all, I'm not in the tribulation, so I haven't got to worry about it. But in the Bible, in the last days, the Lord doesn't have the guy show up like Carpathia does in the end time books that everybody made so much big deal about. LaHaye and them people wrote. He's subtle. He's slick. He comes on a platform of peace. 
He comes on a platform where the whole world wonders after him. They're like amazed by him. Answers to all the question. He doesn't show up like a slothering lunatic. He shows up in pulpit slick as an angel of light. Hey, it's all good. Peace. We're good. Peace. We're, we're, we're good. They're so worried about the evil side of things coming out. The devil's like, yeah, well, y'all keep looking because while you're watching that magic trick, I'm going to show up under a cloak of peace and safety. While y'all are looking for me to show up with demonic activity and, and, and all this violence and wickedness and ungodliness, I'm going to come in, I'm going to look like Jesus Christ. I'm going to come in on a religious political platform and I'm going to take things over. I don't care who the vice president or the president is. It makes no difference to me. My kingdom's worldwide. And he'll step on the throne and people will say, man, man, that guy, man... So great that if that time's not short and the very elect to be deceived, magicians, yep. sleight of hand, yep. connected with the occultic world, doing things that benefit the people, signs, wonders, miracles. Second Thessalonians 2. That's his platform. Not demonic things. That's out in the tribulation period. So everybody's so consumed with what the devil's going to do next. I'll tell you what he's going to do. He's going to show up with an answer to all your problems. Line your pockets with money. Take care of all your food. Take care of all your diseases. Take care of all your wars. Take care of all the problems. He is going to mimic Christ. You're going to think that's him. And the Lord's like, that ain't the guy, man. It's, isn't it interesting that the next time the Lord comes, besides the rapture takes place, when He comes, He comes, you know He's coming to commit war. He ain't coming as a baby. Are you in 1 Kings chapter number 22? Look, if you will, come down to verse number 22. In the interest of time, make it 21. There came forth a spirit and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. And the Lord said unto him, wherewith? And he said, I will go forth and I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, thou shalt persuade him and prevail also. Go forth and do so. Now therefore, behold, the Lord hath put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these thy prophets. And the Lord hath spoken evil concerning thee. You mean the Lord did that? Sure He did. He gave them the desires of their heart. There's a passage over there in the book of Ezekiel. It'll be around Ezekiel 14. And the Lord says to them, He said, Should I be inquired of them at all? I'm going to give them an answer according to the idols they have set up in their heart. And if I allow them to lie, I'm the one that made the prophet lie. God said, I'll do that. I'll allow that to happen. You say, what are you preparing you for? I'm preparing you for the end times. They're slick. They're subtle. Listen, they're in your living room. They creep into houses. Amen. Women laden with sin and lead them captive with diverse lust. Am I in the Bible? I sure am. Must be pretty comfortable. Must be pretty comfortable. In your living room? In your TV room? In your bedroom? Sitting down at your table. Come on, boys. You're going to tell me you're going you're gonna to come home one day and there's the traveling salesman sitting down there having a, a Coca Cola with your wife at the table with a bag of chips? A little too familiar. Got your feet propped up on the sofa, a bag of popcorn open, watching a movie, entertaining emotionally the things. I don't care if it is a Hallmark channel. What you doing watching Hallmark with him? Yes, sir. That all right with you? It's all right for him to lead the little children astray? Pied Piper? Preacher, you've lost your mind. No, you missed it, man. You missed it. You're looking for this frontal assault. No, man, he comes in, got his arm around you, smiling, talking to you. Hey, how you doing, baby? It's good to see you. Conversation. Get you talking. That's why the Lord said, get away. Don't listen to them. You say, why? They'll talk you into stuff you never dreamed possible. Come to Jeremiah, Jeremiah 28. Preacher, you talk like a tree fell on you. I'm telling you, I know what I'm talking about. I know it's true. 
It's so subtle that people don't even see it coming. They're like, well, I don't really think that's that big of a deal. I mean, they're so nice. You say, you keep saying that. I know, I do. It's just harmless. It ain't no big deal. Next thing you know, boy, curled up there in the corner. Gotcha. So how'd that happen? Just relax a little. Just chill out a little. A little easy listening, you know. Set the mood, you know what I'm saying? Set the tone. We good, baby. You know, back in the day, high school. Yeah, man. You know, when we just did what we wanted, lived how we wanted to live. And, you know, I mean, I just smoked a little dope, you know, just drank a little and just listened to a little music and just did a little, you know, but didn't hurt us that bad, baby. It ain't no frontal assault. It ain't no uh, <laughs> no knock warrant. Some of you know what that is. <laughs> It ain't no flashbang through the window over here and catch the curtains on fire and and then through the door. It's, yeah. how you doing? Good to see you. I got something you can't do without. I got the answer to your problem. Smooth, calm, easy going. You'd never see it coming. Cut your throat and watch you breathe. Jeremiah chapter number 28. Uh, look, if you will, please, in verse number 1. And it came to pass the same year, the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, in the fourth year, in the fifth month of Hananiah, the son of Azur, the prophet, which was of Gibeon, spake unto me in the house of the Lord, in the presence of the priest of all the people, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, saying, I have broken the yoke of the king of Babylon. Within two full years will I bring again into this, into this place all the vessels of the Lord's house that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, took away in the place. You say, what is that? That's the end result of what happened in the passage I just read you. The Lord didn't forget the fact that He told them, Buddy, your prophets are lying to you. And he let them go out and get captive. And after they got captive, they come along in Jeremiah and he says, By the way, we got some stuff that was taken from us and we're going to take it back now. How'd they get it from you? Lying preachers. Mm -hmm. yeah. Told us we were going to win the battle. Mm -hmm. You had one preacher that said otherwise and 400 that said it that way. We smacked that guy and put him in jail. Yep. And guess what? The one was right. If the numbers are anywhere near close, you know what that means in the last days? Come to Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15. In the last days, that means you're not going to find as many preachers telling you what the Bible says anymore. You know what they're going to say? They're going to start telling you what modern day uh, politics is about. A friend of mine sent me a thing today, the preacher saying, uh, the audacity of preachers saying that you shouldn't be involved in politics. And then he goes off and we're the only ones that can recognize wickedness. How many of you in here can recognize wickedness? Yeah. Amen. Well, that's an insult to your intelligence to say you can't recognize wickedness. The very idea that a preacher has to tell you when something's wicked. You feather in your nest there, aren't you, buddy? Oh, I, I get it. I get it. I get it. I get it. Hurts your bottom line if you don't get involved in the political scene. I, I get it. You, you can't keep people happy because you won't get on one side or the other. You a fence rider when it comes to politics. We're not talking politics. I don't care how you vote. I'm here to talk to you about Jesus. You say, well, but what do you think about it? I don't. I get all wrapped up in it. I don't care. Go do all your homework and go study and you know who's best for what and all that. You're going to be surprised one day when you find out. Now you do what you want to do with it. I don't care. Honest, I promise you I don't. If I hear my wife talking about it on the phone, I'm going to walk in there and say, excuse me. Amen. Pardon me. That's my way of being nice about saying, you can stop that now. Go ahead, call her tomorrow and say, Miss Trina, can I ask you? <laughs> She'd be looking around the corner thinking... You say, but preacher, why? Well, because I'm trying to help you to get ready for what's coming in eternity. I can't. 
I, I believe it or not, I just told a preacher this. He's pretty upset with me because I made the statement about what I did as far as politics. And I just said this. And I said, listen, brother, I said, my faith in Jesus Christ controlling me, whoever the king is or the president is, is more important to me than who's in the office. I said, I don't believe I control my destiny. I don't believe they control my destiny. I know you don't believe that. I understand that. But I believe no matter who's in power, he's got the power. So if Nero's in control, the Lord's in bigger control than he is. If Caesar's in control, if Hitler's in control, I mean, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with that. I know you're not. You're, you're in control of your own destiny. You're like the jack leg in South Africa who comes out after 17 years and he's the man of his own destiny. You say, well, he, 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 was, he was such a, a nice guy, Mandela, you know, and, and he was against apartheid. And, and you know, he, he suffered because of how apartheid was and, and this and that and the other. It has nothing to do with that. You're not in control of your destiny. Okay, great. You came out there and you got everything turned around. Okay. I don't live in South Africa. Oh, unless you got an agenda and you're trying to make yourself a Mandela... How come you're quiet right there? That's an agenda. I ain't got no agenda. You say, why? I believe if I happen to be in another country, and God can take care of me in another country. I sure hope so. I count on your prayers. I'm in an airplane. They're telling me to mask up. You think I believe the mask is keeping me from getting sick? I wear a mask. It's right to do. I don't have it on now. I'm preaching. I understand that. I'm going to obey the social dis. I'm going to do all that kind of stuff. But do you ever honestly believe if I wear a mask and God wants me sick, I'm getting sick? You ever look at leprosy? Ain't no mask going to keep you from getting it. If you got it, you got it. You know, well, it was contact. It was point of contact. Well, they've been doing that with charismatics for years. Put your hand on the TV, point of contact. You know, you catch a virus. Acts chapter 15, don't worry, I'm not going to get out the egg plate. Acts chapter 15, verse number 24, the Bible said, For as much as we have heard that certain went, which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your souls, subverting your souls, subverting your souls, saying you must be circumcised to keep the law to whom we gave no such commandment. And why are you telling me that, preacher? Don't you understand? These are people that came out under the authority of the Apostle Paul. And they're saying Paul told us to tell you something that Paul said. We never told him to tell you that. They're trying to put you back under the law as if circumcision has something to do with you being saved. See, it's not always something bad they're leading you astray with. It's like, well, I mean, you know, you should do that. This is a good thing. It's ceremonial. There's nothing wrong with that. Paul's like, we didn't tell him to tell you that. They're subverting your soul. In the book of Galatians, he said, Oh foolish Galatians, who hath, uh, when you have started in faith and then you're turning around and going back to works, so I'm perverting the thing there. It's in Galatians chapter number 6. He said, Why are you so easily persuaded to go back under the law? Oh, I get it. Somebody came in and caught you unaware and told you that it's faith and works. Some jack leg preacher. Yep. I just believe if you're saved, oh if you're saved what? They do what you tell them to do? At what point, ladies and gentlemen, do you hear all this Come on. Yeah. foolishness going on about slavery nowadays? How about the preachers that put parishioners in slavery and on a regular basis try to put you in chains instead of let the Holy Ghost to tell you what to do instead of them telling you what to do? How about those guys holding you on the plantation? Yeah. called the Independent Fundamental Bible-Believing Baptist Church. Right. Amen. How about they set you free and let God deal with you? Amen. Amen. Good. How about that? How about them plantation owners? Good. I'll be jumped. I left you figure you got enough sense to know where to wear a mask, don't wear a mask, go to jail, don't go to jail, have enough sense to take care of your physical health. That ain't my place to be telling you that kind of stuff. I'm supposed to preach to you Jesus and Him crucified, prepare you for the judgment seat of Christ, and get you ready for when you leave this earth. I'll be jumped if I'm going to tell you, well, I just think you ought to do this and this and this and this and this and don't do that and that and that and that and that and that. And that. Make your own decision. You're grown up. How about them plantation owners? Why don't we hear something about that? He saved me to set me free. You know what my calling verse was in the book of Isaiah? He said in my passage in the book of Isaiah 61, he said, I'm calling you, you came to set the captives free. 
That ain't just turning people out of jail cells. That's people held in bondage by religion. Amen. Real good. Tell me I'm free and then put me under the bondage of I got to live how everybody else thinks yeah, I ought to live. Yeah. If I live to please Jesus Christ, guess what? There are going to be some people that ain't going to like it. Yeah, amen, I guarantee amen. you they're not going to like it. Amen. Amen. Preacher, you said that stuff about the charismatics over there. They're not going to like you. I'm not in a popularity contest. Amen. I'm here to be popular with one person. Amen. The Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. I'm not a monotheist either. Look in Acts chapter number, or I'm sorry, we already did Acts 15. Look, if you will, please. i got to hurry. Come to Galatians chapter number 1. Galatians 1. Let's keep going toward the book of Revelation. Now, <coughs> here's the thing you want to grab a hold of. You want to grab a hold of, there's liberty in Christ. You want to grab a hold of, God wants you to be here because you want to be here, not because you're out of guilt or out of fear or out of shame. You're here because God wants you to be here. You say, what does that do? It creates a free area for the God to be able to work with the Holy Spirit and deal with you emotionally out of bondage so that God can talk to your heart, not your head. You come in completely relaxed. I'm here because I want to be here, not I'm here in shackles. Listen, bondage always creates bitterness. Always. And whenever you bind somebody up and you make them be there, listen, folks, I appreciate it. I know you love the Lord and believe the book, but trying to force people into church is contrary to what a preacher is trying to do in the pulpit. Having full pews doesn't mean you're full of the Holy Ghost. You can have full pews and have a place where the Lord ain't within 10 miles of the place. You can have half empty pews and have God so full in there. It's kind of like the Lord says, if you get rid of all that, I got room in there. Did you ever notice in 2 Chronicles 5, when they went in, the priest had to leave the building because the Lord squeezed them out? I mean, God got in there so much so they're kind of like, have me excused, I'm leaving, man. Well, you know, the Lord's in that place. Yeah, there's so much of Him in there, I don't fit in there. That's what happened in 2 Chronicles 5, the dedication of the dedicatory of the temple is God came down there and filled the place up. Don't be fooled by the fact that if a place is full of people, it means it's full of God. God is in a place where He can work and move freely. And if He's bound up, you know what He said? That ain't me, man. I came to set Him free. I don't want to knock the chains off of them. Galatians chapter number 1. Look, if you will, please, in verse number 7. You know this passage. Uh, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you, some that trouble you, some that trouble you, and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Wow, Paul, did you just call them a pervert? Yeah. Well, if they're perverting the gospel, wouldn't you say they're perverts? Yeah. All right. You say, well, what does he do? But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any of the gospel unto you, that that which you have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Amen. That's Paul's way of saying, let him go to hell. Right. Say, well, hell ain't in the Pauline epistles anywhere. No, but cursed is certainly in there, and accursed is certainly in there, and damnation is certainly in there, and a multitude of other things. It don't take you long to be able to figure out what Paul's talking about. Right. Then the Bible says in verse number 9, and we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you, be his friend, be his buddy, because he's so nice. I have never heard, now you may correct me on this, come to Galatians chapter 2, and if you do, I'll stand corrected. I have never heard uh, uh, Joel Osteen give a clear plan of salvation. I've never heard that. I didn't say Hatton. I just said I've never heard that. Now you've got to understand I don't really listen to him very much, so that's a possibility also. But, but, but you know what happens? They preach another Jesus when they don't preach on Jesus. You don't have to preach another Jesus. You just have to leave Jesus out. And then you're preaching another Jesus. You're preaching another gospel. You're preaching another way. You say, why? Because when you preach the name of Jesus, people get the heebie-jeebies. You think I'm kidding you? You preach the name of Jesus and you watch how people sit up and take notice. They're over there in the passage. A friend of mine sent him a day. He's a two-seamer from up there in uh, uh, New York, up around Connecticut and all that stuff. He used to play professional baseball. He's a pitcher. Uh, you, you throw a, one of the fastballs called a two-seamer. But it, at any rate, you know, he sent me the passage. He said, this is one of my favorite passages in the Bible. Uh, Paul I know, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? Yeah. Yeah. He said, the way Peacock said it is Jesus I know, and Paul I knew, and who in the blazes do you think you are? <laughs> Yeah, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but there ain't no preachers like that getting no headache from the devil because he's not causing any problem. He ain't stirring up nobody. He's not keeping anybody from heading there. So you know what happens? You get the opposition. You do. You. Not just me. You. 
You people. You say, why? You love the Lord, you believe the book, you preach Jesus. Amen. You mention Jesus, guess what happened? The devils believe and tremble. Amen. You can preach anything else you want to preach, it don't bother them at all. The name of Jesus. Wow. That's an attention getter. Listen, you know what he says? At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall Amen. confess Amen. that He is Lord of the glory Amen. of God the Father. Amen. Is that what he says? Amen. There's power in the name of Jesus. So the way to preach another Jesus is don't preach Jesus. All right, Galatians chapter number 2. Just a few more here. We doing okay? Galatians chapter number 2. Look, if you will, please, in verse number 4. 2 4. And because of false brethren, and because of the false brethren, remember those that uh, have a form of godliness deny the power thereof, the false brethren, unawares brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that we might bring us into bondage. Well, lo and behold, guess what? The preacher's been preaching you the Bible the whole time. Amen. Paul said, I came to set you free. The Lord came to set you free. And they snuck in and said, you got too much liberty. Look at verse 5. To whom we gave place in subjection? No, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. You know what Paul said? I ain't listening to them jack legs at all. He's being sarcastic now. And to whom we gave liberty? He said, no, not for an hour. <laughs> we didn't pay any attention to him at all. That's sarcasm. That's biting sarcasm. Paul said, we didn't pay no attention to him. Why are you paying attention to him? Listen, ladies and gentlemen, you'd be surprised even with little kids. Once they get saved, if you learn to pray for them and let God deal with them, they'll do a much better job on them than you will. Amen. You just have to learn to get your paws off. Amen. It's hard. You ought to be a pastor. You want to get your hands on everybody. Usually around their throat, but you want to get your hands on everybody. <laughs> Look in Ephesians chapter number 4. Ephesians 4. God said, those are my sheep. Ephesians 4, you say, Preacher, you don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, well, in that old building over there, there was a bunch of hides hanging on the wall. But I didn't know any better. And I didn't fleece sheep and I didn't come and shear them. I skin them. And you only skin a sheep one time and you kill them. And I didn't know any better. The Lord came by one day and he said to me, he said, uh, I dropped off some lambs over here. Where are they? I said, uh, well, I think we ate lamb chops and used them in the wintertime for a coat. And all I could do is point to a bunch of hides hanging on the wall. You think that's easy to live with? You know what that makes me want to do? It makes me want to quit and never open my mouth. You can be in such a big hurry to get up in the pulpit and tell everybody what you know. You kill people with these words. I killed some Christians. They're saved, blood bought, born again, going to heaven, didn't mess that up. You think that's easy for me to have to stand here? Why have all the things the Lord could bring to my mind as He bring that to mind? And I'm embarrassed by that. I'm ashamed of that. You know, well, preacher, you meant, well, I, whatever, it still got hurt. There's still repercussions. Hides on the wall. Well, you know, preacher, you know, if you, if you hadn't have tried, you know, I mean, some people get hurt and this and that and the other. Okay, the hides talk to me. They talk to me all the time. Now you can point to the hides too and I deserve whatever you tell me about them. Well, you know, I killed Tony, you killed Tony. You're right, I did. What am I going to do? Quit? But boy, them things talk three and four o'clock in the morning, man. You say, what is it? Instead of letting God fix them, I'm going to fix them overnight. I knew how to do that. I knew how to put somebody on a training regiment and get outward conformity and use peer pressure and other things. Now, I'll tell you, my heart was right. I was trying to help, but I was going about it the wrong way. I was supposed to be a shepherd. I was a butcher. I'm glad some of you forgave me. Some of them sitting back here, been with me for years now, but rough back then, lost a lot. You say, what is that? That's modern day theology that steps in now. And you know what they do? They take the liberty of letting God change you when God's ready to change you based upon your willingness to surrender to Him. And they take over God's reins. And they be God in your life. Can I be real straight up with you one time? I'm always honest with you. Be real straight up with you. You know one of the most difficult things in the world is to wait on God? You ever had a prodigal kid or prodigal grandkids ever in your life? Maybe, maybe not. Y'all probably don't have that in y'all's lives or anything like that. You ever think, man, if I could just stink and knock a knot upside their head and, and thinking, 
man, I can get that under control. Bless God. <laughs> and the Lord's like, uh, you better let me handle that. Amen. That reputation getting away a little bit, you know. Sure. Yeah. You know, y'all, again, y'all probably not that way, but you're thinking, well, somebody's going to remind you that they're related to you or whatever. And you're right. thinking, I'm going to stink and reel them in. And the Lord's like, let it go. You ever had that happen? You know, one of the most difficult things I've struggled with, you say, what sin is it, preacher? A lack of patience. A lack of waiting on God. My goodness, man. I want to play God so bad I could just stand. I, I, if I could just get him and put him in a straight jacket. And the Lord's like, you better let me deal with it. You trust me, don't you? I said, you better let me take care of that boy. Boy, that's hard. But Lord, I know what's best for him. And the Lord's like, oh, you do. <laughs> really? You, you know what's best for him, do you? You don't think I do? You don't think I don't know where they are right this second? What they're doing right this minute? You ever have the Lord come down about 3 o'clock in the morning and not know 900 foot Jesus? Just come kneel down right by the bed by you and say, you sure you ain't, this, ain't, this ain't about you? You sure you ain't worried about what people are saying about you? You ain't really that worried about that prodigal. You sure? You sure about that? I'm just checking. Just what you laying awake about? You worried about the kid or are you worried about what people are going to say about you, preacher? Captain. How about it? Well, Lord, what are you dealing with me for? I ain't the one out here <laughs> doing so and so and so and so. Well, uh, I'm talking to you right now. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Can I give you just a couple more here? It's, we're past 8 o'clock. I'm hoping this is helping you a little bit. Amen. Ephesians 4, verse 14, the Bible says, Then that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. How? By the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie and wait to deceive. Mm -hmm. You know what he just said? Cunning craftiness. Yeah. They're slick. Yeah. They know how to talk. Some of the greatest preachers that I know of right now, two more, Second Thessalonians chapter 2, you'll be familiar with this. Some of the greatest preachers, when I say preachers, I mean good orators. They don't, they don't speak lies. They speak truth. And they have such a way of spinning it that it's so pleasing to hear and so emotionally charging that you don't hear what's missing. You, you don't hear the elements that are there that need to be there that are missing. They're so good at entertaining you that you get auditory exclusion for truth. And you go out and emotionally you're floating this high off the ground. You're like, man. Was so good. Holy Spirit convict you? What, what? You closer to the Lord, are you? You didn't get the part that was missing. You say, where would you get that? Well, in Genesis 3, he took some stuff out. In Matthew 4, he took some stuff out. So what does he do? He oftentimes leaves the most important elements out, but he veils it in such a way that you think, man, that was good. And it's like eating a box of paprika. You got no substance at all. No meat. 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2, look if you will please at verse number 9. Even him whose coming is after, uh, who, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> <coughs> whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power, signs, lying wonders, with all what? Deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not... Uh-oh, what? Where did we start? The love of what? How about that? That they might be saved. For this cause God shall send them strong delusion. Who sent them strong delusion? That they should believe a lie. That they should all believe a lie that they might all be damned. Who believed not... There it is. Remember the passage? It said they resisted the truth. We'll look at what happens with the platform of the Antichrist. 
They resist the truth. Last one, Titus. Titus chapter 1. I'm, I'm telling you right now, not trying to be arrogant when I say what I'm about to say, I'm telling you how the Antichrist is going to come. And it's not with fireballs from heaven or wormwood splashing down and comets and asteroids blowing up and shmitas and blood moons and all that kind of stuff. I'm telling you, slick. He comes as a seducer. Last days, many will give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of... That's the church that is being seduced by somebody that's that powerful. Now do you understand why he says just get away from it? Yeah. Now do you understand why he says just get away from it? Uh, look, I got a friend of mine, he, he monkeys around with snakes and stuff like that and all that. I don't like snakes. Big ones, little ones, live ones, dead ones. You know, it's got a round head, it's got a square head, it's, got a, it's going to have a flat head if I get close enough to it with a shovel. Or a 12-gauge, it ain't going to have no head. Well, did you figure out, was it a good snake or a bad snake? It's a snake, it's a bad snake. You say what? If it don't hurt you, it'll make you hurt yourself. Now, look, I know you, you're like, you know, y'all are Rambo and stuff. You get them and put them in your teeth and all that kind of stuff. Some of you got Pentecostal roots or something about you. You know, you know, you're, you know, you're like, you know, not me. I ain't no Gene Dixon. I ain't messing around with no snakes. I, I, I've had my run-ins with snakes and stuff like that. But I want to ask you a question. If you knew you went into a room and you saw a rattlesnake coiled up in the corner, would you tell your kid, you can go on in the room, just don't go in the corner? Or would you say, stay out of there? Yes. Well, I want to get acquainted with the snake, Daddy. Come over here. I just want to kind of get to know him. He, he looks really nice. He's clean. Wow. He doesn't look like he could hurt anybody. I mean, he's got a little tongue comes out every now and then. But I mean, what's he going to do? He's only got a couple little teeth in there. I mean... I mean, you know, and he's, he's got a rattle like a baby rattle. How could that hurt anybody? You going to tell your kid, go on in there? Well, you're a fool if you do. You're a fool. But you know what we say when it comes to what I'm preaching on right now? We'll go on in the room a little bit. It won't hurt you. You know what the Lord said? You better get away. You better get away. You better get away. Don't go in the room. You say, why? Well, it won't be long before you'll get bit. What fellowship hath Christ with Belial and what fellowship hath light with darkness? Wherefore, come out from them and be ye separate and touch not the unclean thing. You say, why? Well, better get away. Stand up there and contend with him. You can't contend with the angel of light. You'll be so confused you'll think it's the Lord. Watch, somebody dies. Where were you headed? I don't know, but I was going toward a great light. Nobody in the Bible is ever going toward a great light. I saw Satan fall as lightning. Satan, and no marvel for Satan himself, can appear as an angel of... No testimony of salvation, no testimony of the blood of Jesus Christ. I died and I'm a Buddhist. I was headed toward a great light. Wouldn't have been a counterfeit, would it? Nobody in the Bible headed toward a light. Paul said, after from the body, present with the Lord. I'm just saying, see, the counterfeits are slick and are going to get worse. Titus chapter 1, and we'll go home for tonight. Verse number 10, the Bible says this, For many are unreally vain talkers, deceivers, now watch, especially they of the circumcision. In other words, those that ought to know better, watch, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things that they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. Isn't that where we started? They creep into houses. You know what he just said? They must be stopped because they're teaching whole houses things that aren't true. All right, let's stand together and be dismissed. Thanks for bearing with me and helping me to get through that particular part here. We'll cover reprobate. Uh, concerning the faith and uh, on uh, Sunday if you can bear with us and be here.